And this morning we're going to be continuing through the Sermon on the Mount. And we're in Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The pure in heart are those that will see God. So my name is, if we've not met, my name's Dan. I lead the team here and for about the next 30 minutes I'm going to share. And then I believe God is going to move. So we're going to start, as I often do with these, at the end with they will see God. What does it mean to see God? (laughs) Well, it's important to know that often when Jesus speaks, um, he makes reference to the Old Testament scriptures. We know and we've discussed, haven't we, that Jesus was stood on the hillside, on that on that mountaintop, and he was preaching to a a group of people, most of whom will have been uh, Jews, different backgrounds, different um, uh, different wealth, different social status, but they were, most of them would have been from the local area. And he is stood on the hillside, and he uses those words, "Blessed are the pure in heart." for they will see God. And, and the Jewish people knew their scriptures. They grew up, they learnt uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. They learnt the Psalms, they learnt what the prophets said. And so when Jesus refers to something, uh, it's quite often that he's actually reminding them of something uh, that was brought in, the old, in what we would call the Old Testament. Trevor talked about this last week. Uh, he was Jesus referred to that passage in Hosea. And, and, and in this, blessed are the pure in heart, it is likely that the Jewish people would have almost immediately been taken to Psalm 24. So let's turn, shall we, if you've got your Bibles or your tablets or your iPads or a screen, um, let's turn to Psalm 24. And it says, this is in the English Standard Version, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell within. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. So David uses that phrase in verse 3. He says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? The hill of the Lord appears a lot through scripture and it's important to know what it means. <laughs> the first thing is the hill of the Lord is a physical place. Jerusalem, the capital city, was built on a hill. The temple of God's presence was built on a hill. And so every year the Jews would come, three times a year they would come and from all across Israel and they would go and gather in Jerusalem for the festivals, and they would literally climb the hills. The, the Jewish people uh, would, would come and they would literally climb up to where God's presence was in the temple. This is why if you ever look through the Psalms, Psalms 120 to 134, they're called the, the Psalms of Ascent, the Songs of Ascent, because they were the songs that were sung and spoken as they ascended up to God's presence, up to the temple. But as with so many things in scripture, there is both the physical 
and the biblical image, the imagery that God uses. And multiple times throughout scripture, we read of this image of the hill of the Lord, the mountain of the Lord being where God's presence dwelt. Right the way back in the book of Genesis, Eden, the Garden of Eden was on a hill. It had four rivers that flowed from it. And how many of you know that rivers flow downhill? Yeah? <laughs> and, so, and so Eden was literally on a hill because the four rivers flowed from it. We read in the book of Exodus how God's presence came and dwelt on the hill on Mount Sinai. And then right at the end of the Bible, we read that the new Jerusalem is on a hill. John says, I saw a vision of the holy mountain. The mountain, the hill of the Lord, refers to where God's presence is. And we sometimes sing, there's various songs about climbing the mountain, climbing the hill of the Lord. And that's what we mean when we're singing that. We're not literally, you know, getting us all going for a climb up the, climb up whole moss. We're saying, God, we want to ascend into your presence. We want to come into your holy place. So when David speaks of climbing the hill in Psalm 24, he is speaking both physically, because that's what they did, and he's speaking metaphorically. He's speaking of how can I get closer to you, God? And he says this, and he says, the requirements for entering, he writes down, are these clean hands and a pure heart. Now, in the Old Testament, very few people met with God. Very few people had the opportunity, were able to enter the presence of God. The priests who ministered in the temple, in order to, the temple uh, was made up of, of several spaces, and one space was the Holy of Holies. And in that space was the Ark of the Covenant, and that was where God's presence dwelt. And you couldn't just walk in there. <laughs> in fact, the only people that could go in there were the priests. In fact, the only people that could go in there were the chief priests. And they could only go in at certain times of year. And they could only do it once they'd been through a lot of ritual cleansing. And let me tell you, someone who's just taken on the leadership of a church, I am very glad that we do not have to go through some of that stuff these days. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, getting donut, you think getting donut icing out of the carpet's hard enough. Um, but the priests would, would go through all these rituals and the, this cleansing uh, type purification in order to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies. And even then when they went in, they had bells hanging off them so that they could hear that they were still moving because God's presence was so dangerous and that if they went in and they were impure then they might die and then they would literally be pulled out by a rope you couldn't then go and get them you'd have to pull them out oh the bells have stopped pull the rope and before the temple before the temple was a thing uh, in 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 from kind of two Sam, the book of two samuel onwards before the temple was built um we had the tabernacle and before the tabernacle um Moses met with God. And Moses met with God in the burning bush in Exodus 3. And you remember that story where he's walking through the desert and there is a, a bush on fire and he goes towards it. And God speaks to him. The bush is not burning up. It's, not, it's, it's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And, and he goes towards it and God speaks to him from the bush and says, Stop. Don't come any closer, but take off your shoes, for this is holy ground you are standing on. Don't come any closer. See, God is holy. We've been singing it this morning. God is holy, and to be in his presence, you have to be holy. So when David declares that uh, who can ascend, who can come into this holy place. He then says these, the two things, clean hands and a, and a pure heart. What he's talking about when he says clean hands is, is the exterior things, those rituals, the things we do, the things we have to do in order to enter God's presence. 
It's talking about our actions and the way we go about things. And then when he says pure heart, he's talking about the inside. Our interior, what goes on within us. But we have to be careful with this in, the, in, in our culture because the heart is often associated with feelings, isn't it? You know, the heart wants what the heart wants. And, and, and uh, you know, we, we, it's all about our feelings. Oh, I just do what my feelings say. They, my emotions guide me. But the heart in, in Hebrew times was not just about your feelings. The heart referred to the whole of your interior, the whole of your interior uh, being. It referred to, yes, your feelings and your emotions, but it also referred to your mind. What did you think about? And it referred to your will. That, that sense of this thing, I'm, I'm going to go there, I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to do this. And at this moment in history, as Jesus stands before these people and says these words we read in the Sermon on the Mount. The rabbis who were teaching at the time were placing a very heavy emphasis on clean hands. It was all about clean hands. It was all about ritual purification, ceremonial purity, making sure that you did everything right in fact, there are texts uh, written around that time which talk almost exclusively about doing the right thing. But they mention very little about the heart. And so Jesus, knowing this, and knowing that the people of Israel would have known about Psalm 24, be familiar with Psalm 24, comes in and says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. He doesn't mention hands. Blessed are the pure in heart. And so is it, is it that it's not important that I do, you know, what I do with my hands? Is it, is it not, my act, do my actions not matter? Well, we've got a whole teaching series on the Sermon on the Mount. So you'll discover, if you come back... <laughs> That it does matter what you do with your hands. It does matter what your actions are. But in this moment, Jesus is shifting the priority. He's shifting it from the emphasis of it's about what you do to the emphasis of it's what's on the inside. It's about who you are. See, to Jesus, what goes on on the inside matters more than what goes on on the outside. And we see this by who he hangs around with, don't we? He, he despised the religious people. He got frustrated with them. He got cross with them. All the people who were going through the, the, the rituals, all the people who were doing exactly you know, by the letter of the law, and I, I won't do that on the Sabbath, and I'll do this, and all the people who were doing that in, in order to make themselves holy, he got fed up with. But he went and had dinner at a tax collector's house. He went and hung around with sinners. He went and hung around with the riffraff of society. Those who would have been ceremonially unclean. And he did this much to the annoyance of those religious people. Jesus even allowed one of these unclean sinners to pour expensive perfume over him. And when they looked on, when the religious people looked on and they said, why is he allowing that? He said, look at the heart. Because it's the heart that matters most. And then what happens on the outside, that then becomes an overflow of what is on the inside. Now this word pure can stir up some all kinds of things in our thinking can't it um if you've been around christian circles uh, for a while you know you may have this image of of purity as being a bunch of things that i need to do in order to be pure like some kind of moral code some kind of outworking if i do this and this and this and this i can stay pure 
But could it be that we've often got it the wrong way around? See, the outworkings are good, but they are the fruit of holiness. They are the fruit of a pure heart. And you can't have the fruit without the root. The root is a pure heart. The root is a pure heart. And then from that place, we get the fruit, which is that outworking, those things we do. If we try and go after doing the things to make ourselves pure, we'll just get frustrated. You can never, we can never do that. And to have, so to have a pure heart, just to kind of give a definition of it, is to have an undivided heart, an unblemished heart, untainted heart, a heart that is totally, 100% set on God and on his purposes, a heart that trusts and doesn't seek fulfillment in anything else. A divided heart cannot see God and his purposes in full. It can't. Because there's things getting in the way. I, um, I'm not a very fashion conscious man. It may surprise you to know. Um, I like to buy clothes that are comfortable. <laughs> and... Um, and I don't, I don't go after brands and that sort of thing. I literally buy the same pair of jeans every time I need new jeans from Next because they're the ones that fit over my ridiculously fat like, calves down here. Um, my mighty calves, as they've been described by people. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, and I like to, you know, I, I, I'd like to wear a comfy hoodie and, and things like that. And, and anything kind of branded that you see me in is probably a present from someone, I'll be honest. Um, or it reflects one of my favourite sports teams. But, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not big into, into brands or that sort of thing. But there is, there is one brand that I do like, and that's when it comes to my sunglasses. Um, and I love the brand Oakley. <laughs> I love the quality of them. I could go into it now. Um, and I, I love the, the quality of the frames and the lenses, and, and just, they just feel nice. <laughs> and I can see well. And so when I was 18, my parents said to me, what do you want for your 18th birthday? And I said, I really want a pair of Oakley sunglasses. So they bought me a pair. And they, they had these chunky metal frames. And the lenses were crystal clear. And I put them on and it was brilliant. I could see so clearly. And then gradually over time, I would take these sunglasses and I would take them off and I'd, I'd fold them nicely and I'd put them into their nice little soft case and then I'd pull the little drawstring and then I'd put them into their hard case and then I'd put that and I'd put that carefully in my bag and I looked after them like proper diligently until one day I got a scratch. I know, terrible, hey? And uh, first world problems. <laughs> and um, and I, I got a scratch on these. And uh, I was frustrated, but I thought, right, I'll keep looking after them. I'll keep looking after them. And then, and then I got another scratch. And then I got another mark. And, you know, eventually my son got these locals were literally, like, taken off and thrown in the car. Just like, and I'll grab them next time I need them. But the thing was, I got used to the dirt I got used to the scratches. I got used to all the marks on them. What I didn't realize was I couldn't see properly. And then we got to a point where they were literally starting to fall apart. We ended, they, they sat on the, the mantelpiece in one of our old houses and we had a little a gas fire. And it actually bent the arm round. <laughs> Um, and I still wore them. And then one day, my wife says to me, Dan, you've had these sunglasses for 11 years. I think you can buy a new pair. <laughs> and so I went out and I bought, I saved my money and I bought myself another pair of Oakleys and I put them on and suddenly I could see. They were crystal clear. 
See, with all those scratches, all those marks in the way, my vision was obscured. A divided heart cannot see everything. I cannot see God because there's so many other things getting in the way. There's things move, diverting the light out of the way. There's things blocking the light. But clear it out. Get a fresh pair. Get a pair that work. Get a pair that no blemish. And the light will flow. God's promise is that when your heart is pure, when it is undivided, then you will see him. So how do I know where my heart is at? What words come out of our mouths? The second half of Matthew 12, 34 says this, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If all that comes out of your mouth is criticism, moaning, anger, frustration, that's what your heart is full of. But if all that comes out of your mouth is joy and love and kindness and mercy, that is what your heart is full of. Another question you can ask yourself, where do I put my trust? Where do I put my, my trust? And if you're not sure, I encourage you to do a little audit on, your, on yourself. Because you can look at where you put your trust by looking at these three things. Where do you put your time? Where does your time go? Where does all your energy go? What do you put your energy into? Where do you put your money? Now, I'm not talking about just blindly following. Yeah, yeah, I'll just do this, I'll do this. We wrestle sometimes with the scriptures, don't we? And we do that in community. We wrestle. But the question is, do we put our trust in what Jesus says? Or in what man says? A divided heart says this. It says, you can have this thing, but you're not having this. As a church, we are hugely blessed um, that many of you give financially. We believe in bringing our gifts and our offerings and our tithes to God. We believe in that God gives us our finances and that we give them back to it. And, and we are hugely blessed as a community that there are faithful people in this room uh, and not in this room that continue to faithfully give to the work of the church. And that is how we are able to do things. It's how we're able to have the lights on this morning because people financially give. And we, we don't sit and look at the numbers I want you to know that my first job on a Monday morning is not to pull up the latest offering account and go, oh, I wonder who's doing it. We don't do it. We don't sit and look at it in that way. In fact, our finance administrator, Melissa, uh, she sees all that data. I just see a big number. I just see the, the, the accumulated giving. So we don't, we don't analyze in that way. Um, but every so often, for different reasons, someone makes a decision to leave our church family. Some people are called off to, God calls them to go and do something else, God moves them on, uh, that sort of thing. But, and sadly, some people leave for other reasons, break down in relationships, various other challenges people have. And... Um, we, at that point, do look at the finances. Because it's important we know how that kind of affects us going forward. We have to financially plan. We have to budget. And therefore, if, if somebody leaves the church, we need to know, is this, you know, 
is this going to be a significant hit? If someone turns out someone's, give, you know, if we've got an offering account that's 160,000 pounds, it turns out the person who gave 100,000 pounds is leaving, then we've got an issue, haven't we? So it's important that we do our, so we do, our, we do, our, and I just say to Melissa, our finance, I say, could you just let me know how much, you know, if, how much that person's given? Here's a pattern that I have noticed. When people have left the church for sad reasons generally, when people have left the church, their giving stopped way before they actually left. People's hearts became divided. And so they stopped giving. They turned up, but they stopped giving. See, to a certain extent, you can fake it, can't you? You can turn up this morning and you can lift your hands in worship. You can help put the chairs away. You can, to a certain extent, fake it. But if your heart's divided, there'll be, there'll be something that's not right. You can turn up and wash your hands. You can have clean hands. But where is your heart? And this is why Jesus did not tolerate the religious people of the day. This is why he got frustrated with them because they went through all the rituals, but their hearts were not for the kingdom of God. And it's also why they didn't see him sat in front of them. The king of kings was sat in front of them and they didn't even notice. So those with undivided hearts were those who saw Jesus. And that's the invitation God is offering us today. To see God. What does it mean to see God? Well, Moses asked God to show him his glory. And the word says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. He said, you can't see my face. For no one can see it and live, but I will show you my goodness. To see God is to see his goodness, his faithfulness all around us, to see it at work. It's to stand in the presence of God, to experience his mercy, his love, his kindness, his hope. It lifts our perspective into a bigger story. It's to see him moving all around us, to see the way he's moving in other people's lives, to see the way he's moving in our town. It's to see things like he does, like we sang this morning. And to see where he's calling us to partner with him in extending the kingdom of God. So what do I do if my heart is divided? Well, let's return to David. David was a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible tells us. But there's a story where he makes, and we don't have time to go into it this morning, but he makes some terrible decisions. And that's putting it lightly. His heart in that moment becomes divided. He goes after other things. He goes after the things of this world. But David wrote this just after that. In Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. When we have an undivided heart, the way to get a divided heart, sorry, the way to get an undivided heart is to return to him and ask. Create in me a pure heart. One word for this is confession. 
1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And in charismatic circles, we don't really like to talk about confession, do we? Um, It's just not something we like to talk about. (laughs) But it's biblical. And to be clear, I'm not talking about the kind of Catholic practice of coming to confession. We are not constructing a box in that corner for me to sit in. (laughs) That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about simply coming before God, being honest with him, and allowing his presence to work in our lives. And it doesn't have to be what we might think of as a big sin. It is anything that we allow to take the place of God in our hearts. Those things become idols. And some of those things are good things. Some of those things are initially God-given things. But then we turn them around and we start, we start putting all our energy into that thing rather than into our relationship with God. And it actually draws us away. <laughs> And so we need to confess to God and we need to put God back in his rightful place. God, I have made that thing an idol. God, I have distracted myself with this. God, I have been pursuing this thing. I'm returning to you. We've talked about this before, but last year there was an outbreak of God's presence in a university in America called Asbury. And... um, if you don't know, basically, at the end of a, a chapel service, a number of students just hung around, which apparently is very rare. They don't generally hang around. Uh, and a number of students just hung around, and they kept worshipping. They felt they just need to keep worshipping. They keep worshipping. And a hunger for God's presence drew, grew, and then more people came in, and more people came in, and then they kept going. And it didn't stop for 16 days. People kept coming night and day to worship God. And as it did, people realized that to know God better, to experience God better in that moment, they needed to come and confess. And so confession became a hallmark of of this renewal, this moment. Some Young people would spend, and we're talking kind of 18 to 25-year-olds, would come down the front and they would be on their knees for over 30 minutes, pouring out before God. And this cycle just kept happening. People would hear, something's happening in that auditorium, I need to get there. And then when they got there, they'd experience the fact that God was in the room and they'd, I need to confess because I want to see him more. And we have, we've had a, some little glimpses of this, haven't we? If you were with us a couple of weeks ago up in the upper room, up in the attic, we called out for more of God and then the word of God came to us. What are you going to lay down to experience more of me? And so what they did in Asbury, which I think they had this, um, this four-part prayer that they prayed through with people that I think is really helpful for us. The first thing they did was they, they encouraged the young people to confess and the young people would pour out, just now at the, the feet of God, just pouring out, I've done this, I've done this, God, forgive me of this, forgive me of this, I've put this in, this, I've put this in a place above you. The next thing they would do was they would then pray with them and they would, they would say, you need to cancel the permission that you have given the enemy because your sin and the things that you have let take God's place have started to rule over bits of your life. And you need to cancel that permission. You need to say, you're not having that anymore. <laughs> you're not having that part of my heart. You're not having that part of my mind and my, part of my thinking. And they would say, you're, yeah. <laughs> they would cancel that permission. And then once they'd cancelled the permission, they would command the darkness to leave. You don't have any place here. 
God is God reigns over this heart. Darkness be gone. And then they would say, Come, Holy Spirit. Because once you've created space for God, He can come and meet you. And this feels like a big ask, doesn't it? Blessed are the pure in pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. I don't think I can do it. But we can say, Come, Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Jesus thought it was possible. And he died on the cross to make it possible for us to be able to stand before God and say, God, I am so sorry. I give it all to you. And then Jesus says, go. Go and sin no more. Like the woman caught in adultery. So we're going to invite the band back up. And we're going to spend some time just creating a bit of space. I just want to give this this bit of caution here. It's really easy to think we're chasing God when we're chasing it, actually chasing the experience. We can have great times of worship and we think we're chasing God. Like, oh, I love coming into this place. I love, I love the music. I love, and actually, you realise what you're chasing is the experience. You're not chasing God. And you can have all the feels, you know that. Oh, I can feel God's in the room. Yeah. And then we, <laughs> that kind of feel. <laughs> but then when we leave, we don't. We but we don't allow God to change us in that moment. And we just come for the experience of, I like Sundays, they feel great. I enjoy God's presence. I enjoy this experience of being in God's presence. And what God is asking of us is that we chase after him. We chase after the one whose presence we see. So we're going to create some space now. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God.